Hello and uh, welcome to my new Catullan conversation where I'm very pleased to welcome David Wright to talk about Catul Bassis in Carmen 27. I will be your host this evening or morning or day whenever you watch for this particular Catullan conversation. Uh, I am Christian Lehman in Ohio. Uh, David Wright, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi everyone. Yeah, so my name is Dave Wright. I'm currently a lecturer in classics at Fordham University uh, in New York City. Uh, but this fall, I'll be a visiting assistant professor at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina. And um, yeah, one of my interests is the catabasis or the descent of the underworld. But I'm also in the metapoetics, so this conversation is sort of a, a meeting of <laughs> two of my interests here. So I'm very excited to be here. And I'm excited to have you. And uh, we're all going to be quite excited to see what we can make of the relatively short Catullus 27. I do want to briefly mention the image on the background here. It comes from Spain and uh, it shows a female tavern keeper pouring wine. It's a bit of a spoiler to what we'll be discussing. So Catullus 27, seven lines long uh, and David, why don't you give us a reading of the English? Sure. You, bo you boy there, serving out the vintage vino. Makes me stronger and sharper tasting cupfuls. Follow the lady of the revel's orders, who's more drunk than the killer stuff she's drinking. You, though, pure water nymphs, can get the hell out. Ruination to wine, you are. Move over. Join the Puritans. Here is the un... Here the wine is unmixed. Oh. <laughs> it's so great. So let's start just uh, at a surface level. If we were encountering this poem, uh, how would you summarize the plot of this poem? Yeah, basically we have the speaker, seems to be some sort of party. Um, and yeah, they're, they're ordering um, one of the, the slaves to come over and, and, and bring wine. And it seems like it's kind of crazy. There's some sort of like figure who's in, in charge of the drinking here. Um, and the speaker's kind of making it clear that, oh, hey, we're here to get drunk. No, please no mixing of water, water the wine like we, we have in, in different Greco Roman contexts. Um, and here it's all about drinking, drinking the wine straight. Yeah. And it's, it's funny. Like, in, oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, please. What's I'm going to say, in, in, I remember when I read this poem in college, we called it plastered faster. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and I think that's one way that people have read it, in fact. So I've gathered a few uh, quotations here of what some other people that are not either Christian nor David have said. So Michael Putnam, uh, back in 1969, at a time when you would think there's a little bit more partying happening, but not in his poetry, uh, this poem's ancestry, uh, what's happening in it, the drinking has been traced to Anacreon and with cre clearer direction to Diphilus. But a literary pedigree, however unsullied, should not mislead us into dismissing the poem as, quote, little more than an expansion of some verses of Diphilus, which is what um, a prominent critic from the 19th century, Ellis, said, or as ein stylisierte Trinkspruch, which is Kroll, a stylized drinking song. Uh, Cairns proposed by introducing an allusion, posthumia, which we will be discussing, to an incident from early Roman history into this kind of sympotic poem, Catullus is of course blending Greek and Roman materials in a way characteristic of Roman poets and making an original contribution to the genre. Uh, one of the latest uh, commentators, Green, whose translations I use in these Catullan conversations, concluded that it's probably a simple drinking song, often compared to those of Anacreon and the Greek tradition, rather than the elaborate metaphor for poetry postulated by Wiseman. So much dismissiveness. <laughs> I mean, those 19th century interpretations do track though. Like, oh yeah, Roman poetry. It's just, it's just like a, a rehashing of some earlier Greek poet. Yeah. And it's interesting how like, you know, today we're going to be going in a very kind of different direction, kind of filling this poem with meaning, um, much like one might fill a, a cup with stronger mm -hmm. unmixed wine mm -hmm. rather than these kinds of opinions. Mm -hmm. So we're getting real. We're taking the, the bitter cups ourselves and we're going to say exactly what we think. Yeah. <laughs> in, in fact, we will. Uh, 
but first I want to cover some of this background, this idea that Catullus is working in a drinking tradition. Um, mm -hmm. But as with so many things that we see with Catullus, right? Uh, recently, I spoke uh, in a Catullan conversation with the idea of translation, how Catullus brings over Sappho to his Latin tradition. Um, and here, it seems we're going to bring some drinking over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so Diphilus, the person that was mentioned, uh, we know about him because of fragments that survive um, from the Daphne Sophists here by Athenaeus. Uh, and just quickly, Diphilus, the comic poet, says, Oh, Bacchus, to all wise men, dear, how very kind you do. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that this was going to be in rhyming couplets. <laughs> how very kind you do appear. You make the lowly hearted proud and bid the gloomy laugh aloud. You fill the feeble man with daring and cowards strut and bray past bearing. Is this like a Victorian translation? Yeah, well, it's it's the free translation from it's online. Free <laughs> so probably, yeah. Uh, yeah, so to the viewer, uh, the Greek does not rhyme. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we see some pretty standard things here, though, about like Bacchus and drinking. Um, anything stand out that you kind of associate with? Yeah, I guess this association of like Dionysus with with truth and, and sort of, you know, um, sort of speaking, speaking what you mean and sort of actually it also sort of giving power to, to the marginalized as well. We sort of see that this pattern with uh, Dionysus and we could, I mean, we could bring it to like fifth century Athens with the, the festival of festival of Dionysus where we have these, uh, you know, uh, tragedies and, and comedies being put out and that's like a, a great theme, uh, a common theme. And these are sort of just like, oh yeah, during these, during these dramatic works, we have people sort of speaking, speaking to true matters in, in society. Um, uh, so that's thrillingly said. Um, and this idea of giving power to the marginalized, I'm actually going to jump ahead to talk about a couple words, right? Even at the beginning of Archetelus 27, this idea that we apply minister to a slave, mm. right? where we have the kind of lowest of the inversion of the elevating it with that minister. And then the idea that the, the woman, Postuma, is going to be called a magistra. Yeah. yeah so Dionysus is associated with, with with like, you know, inversion, inversion society. And I didn't notice that, but yeah, that, that's, that makes sense to me. That's really cool. Right, yeah. So I mean, <laughs> topsy-turvy. Topsy-turvy yeah. that, and I mean, this is, by the way, is not what Ellis means when he says, it's little more than an expansion of Diphilus. Ellis is not talking about Diphilus' sophisticated engagement with the topsy-turvy nature of Bacchus. Mm. Uh, and similarly, I think with some of these, um, the gloomy to the laughter, um, laughter is going to be something like into, in the face of what do, does one laugh is going to be an interesting question for us, I think, today. Um, yeah. So we also get a reference here to the bitter cups, but um, Catullus uses a really interesting word, kalikes, um, from kalix, which is a Greek word for kulix, right? There's plenty of other cup words that Catullus can pick, uh, but it seems like this is a marked mm. kind of Greek term. And so I thought for fun, we would look at uh, the oldest piece of Greek writing that we have uh, mm. on a cup, which is Nestor's cup. Yeah, um, I gotta love that cup. Yeah, I, I don't, I wish I knew my Greek pottery better, but it's like a, is a Kulix like a bigger cup? Is there an implication that it's bigger, I wonder? Um, uh, yeah, and I think it's, it's the shallower one that you put your hand on. A yeah, the Skiffos maybe, yeah. No, I like that. Yeah. So this is, this, is, this is the deeper drinking cup, which I think uh, might be significant. Yeah. Just, uh, we need to have more material culturists on yes, here. Yes, I know. So this is some archeologist out there who's already <laughs> uh, writing a takedown of our- Indeed, indeed, leave a comment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Those, those are, click and subscribe. That's the other thing you do. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Well, we get to a really, but so one of these early pieces, right? The earliest known inscription I am the cup of Nestor, good for drinking. Whoever drinks from this cup, desire for beautifully crowned Aphrodite will seize him instantly. Uh, here we have this idea of desire linked with wine. That... Also, maybe the, the old taking on things that the old don't normally do such as like sex with, with Aphrodite and right. that's sort of a theme with Dionysus too. It's like it, it gives the old people more power to <laughs> do things they normally can't. Yeah. And like a Nestor who 
is close in terms of age to death, getting yes. to do this thing that represents life and uh, yeah. liveliness. Uh, so just, you know, I like fun. that one. Uh, yeah. So some of these drinking songs that also get mentioned, like Anacreon, we see here, uh, come boy, bring us a bowl so I can drink a sconce. Pour in 10 ladles full of water, five of wine, so I can bacchanize once more with no disgrace. Or again, come now this time, let's drink, not in this Scythian style with din and uproar, but dip to the sound, uh, or sip to the sound of decent songs, and then finally, bring water, bring wine, boy, bring us wreaths of flowers, I'm going to spar with love. The reason I wanna lay down these, this background is because of Catullus' very strong shift away from that Greek tradition of mixing. Yeah, the idea that, oh, this is what's, and here you have very sort of like Greek barbarian dichotomy here of like, yes, you know, we Greeks know how to put enough water in and, and sort of act like all civilized, whereas these Scythians now, they, they just drink it straight and, you know, it causes did an uproar. Yeah. Yeah. And for those of you that remember your Odyssey, it is of course the trick of Odysseus to overcome uh, the Cyclops is he does not water down the Cyclops' wine. Yep. But then we come uh, back to Catullus, who I have marked up with my arrows here, but this time uh, we're going to focus on some of these more uh, water wine elements. Uh, so I'll read it again to remind us of what it is, and then I think David is going to take away the conversation. You boy there, serving out the vintage vino, makes me stronger and sharper tasting cupfuls. Follow the lady of Rebels' orders, who's more drunk than the killer stuff she's drinking. You though, pure water nymphs, can get the hell out. Ruination to you, ruination to wine you are. Move over, join the Puritans. Here, the wine is unmixed. Yeah, so I, I think here Catullus is, 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 is talking about poetry here. And since earliest Greek poetry of this association of, of water, it truly springs with poetic inspiration. That's why these things, there's a reference to the Lumphi, who are uh, technically water nymphs, so they're italic water deities, but by metonymy it can mean just water, but these often were like were springs, you know, throughout Italy. But we have like the Hippocrene in Greece. And that other, uh, f that other um, spring I can't, whose name I can't think of, and there's this sort of like, oh, certain poets go to the spring, other poets go to the spring, and then, but also we have the contrast that with wine, where yes, certain poets just drink wine, <laughs> um, and that tends to be more associated with like the 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 lyric poets. So it seems like uh, here Catullus is sort of possibly signaling, okay, certain poetic influences. Um, and with this focus on wine, maybe he's more in the sort of um, Archilochus tradition who, who more openly talks about drinking wine and wine as uh, his, his inspiration. Uh, so something you say that, that I'm really glad you reminded me of, the Lumphi being uh, Greek water nymphs, because in saying get out of here, wa pure water nymphs, it's saying like get out of here Greek tradition. Like Catullus mm. knows what he's accessing in these first four lines. And he's like, you know what? we're getting rid of Greece. We're getting rid of that kind of Grecian mm. influence as I go and do my new thing. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, and yeah, I, I think we can like perhaps see this wine that he's drinking. The fact that it's uh, Amoriare is bitter or drier, however you want to take it. And uh, there's this sort of connection with dryness and, and, and satire and sort of, and, and, and speaking harshly, um, you know, I think, because I believe it, that these poems are sort of intentionally arranged, if you look at the next two poems, uh, Catullus gets a little harsher uh, in his next poems. And you can sort of see this as, uh, as perhaps sort of signaling like, okay, I'm getting drunker. Uh, I, I'm drinking the, the mean wine because <laughs> I'm going to say some, some mean things about people. Right. Um, so if we look at some of these elements right now that you've talked about, uh, here's an example from Callimachus's hymn to Apollo about the metapoetics of water. Um, Apollo kicked envy with his foot and spoke. Sure, the Assyrian river is big, but its waters carry heaps of earthly detritus and lots of garbage. Right, so bigness in Catullus in Callimachus is bad, uh, but it's especially bad because it gets dirty and things mm -hmm. are mixed in with it, whereas you want the pure. Um, later on, Ovid will take this over with the thin stream versus the wide. Yeah. Um, 
rushing body of water. And, and this is interesting too, because like Calamicus, you know, he's talking about he's there's a certain kind of water you want, but it, Calamicus was sort of famously cast as oh, he, he's the, the water drinker poet. And I feel like so often he's like, oh, Catullus, he's just kind of modeling himself off of Calamicus here. But yeah, I think like you were saying before, I, I sort of see a distinct break here from Calamicus by sort of wanting to kick out the waters. Even yeah. like, cause, cause like a spring water is supposed to be, that's the, that's the, that's the opposite of a river. It's sort of smaller and more refined. And so I'm now, you know, this is the arbitrary nature of juxtaposing passages, but because in the Calimachus he's saying, um, Apollo is kicking envy. Obviously it's metapoetic here because he's kicking envy with the foot. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's a metapoetic pun, but uh, Catullus says, hey, Greek water nymphs, Lymphi, go to the Saueros. And earlier in Catullus 5, this gets to your point, David, about the poems going in order. In Catullus 5, I was like, hey, our kisses, like, whatever. We can, like, curse the Saueriorum, right? The more severe people. It's the only two times that this word appears in Catullus. And so it's like the envious old people, which mm -hmm. in this case are also kind of the like people that would might say, oh, Greek values are better than these new neoteric Roman values. Yeah, I'm also struck too by the Amariores. Isn't it Senoriores in Catullus V, the, the poem you're referring to? And I don't know if I'm just like trying to find connections. Actually, no, it's a where you are. Never mind. I take back my 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 budding wild okay. theory. <laughs> Um, but that, that's how that's where ideas come from. <laughs> yes, um, exactly. I'll start there. Uh, here's uh, 28 and 29. I don't know that, that will look really yeah. fully, but if you want to. Yeah, basically, like going back to a saying about, oh, he's saying, oh, bring me the bring me, bring me the more bitter wine because I'm about to get nasty. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, I think it's significant that these two poems uh, follow it where in, in 28 he, he's attacking uh Veranius and and Fabulus and interesting how these are his in, in other poems like Fabulus is, is, is and Veranius have mentioned as his friends um but it, it's sort of he's attacking them so, so, sort of for their um for for for, for, for for financial issues um but there's um sort of a lot of obscene obscene uh language in it and same thing with 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 29 where he's uh attacking uh memora and sort of transferably memora who is the famously the um soldier of caesar and actually people argue over who uh romulus is uh, in this passage but it's sort of a very sexually charged uh invective talk and yeah i think the the bitter wine sort of looks looks forward to this like i'm drinking because in the next poems i'm gonna i'm gonna say some mean things so yeah. things that things, things that are obscene. And I think it's really striking. So I had uh, to add to some of these elements. Uh, so in 28, there's this, uh, this idea of um, flat wine and hunger being associated with it. Um, same with um, Mamura, who's called the shameless gut of Borax. Mm. Like, and Catullus just finished talking about like pure unmixed wine. And then these people come along with this flat wine and this like excessive belly. Uh, so that's just kind of, oh, it's. Yeah. Things oh, are building. The echoes, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So, one other thing that hits me because of this Amariore is um, we're so used to Catella's talking about amo amare, this idea of love. And you hit those first few so, set, uh, letters. It's not going to make a lot of sense following cup, but if you might imagine something like a cup of love, say, with um, that short a and then that long a those at least those first two syllables you're still the potential for love to hit at the end but in the great like pun in latin love and bitterness are very closely sonically related yeah and also in, in poem 29 too has erotic themes uh, as well so you could be looking forward to that yeah so one of the big themes that we are going to introduce today is your passion, which is the idea that uh, this poem has catabatic elements. So 
Can you yeah. Just remind us what a catabasis is. So yeah, this is one of my things, and a catabasis is uh, a descent to the underworld. Um, many Greek and Roman heroes do it. Um, actually, in the Odyssey, it's like a pseudo catabasis where Odysseus he, he goes to the land of the dead, but he actually more summons the souls to him. It's more like it's technically an aquia, but it's catabatic like. But also, you have in the Roman world, like Aeneas, he goes to the underworld. Um, it's always for some sort of that, that some sort of task they have to do. Orpheus goes to to retrieve his lost uh, his, his 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 lost his lost wife. Um, Aeneas is going to like learn how to be a Roman, uh, things like that. So it's a very um, common trope in mythology. Sometimes we have like more metaphoric catabases. Like for example, in book 24 of the Iliad, when Priam goes to get uh, the body of Hector from Achilles, some have read that as a catabasis because he like, he crosses a river, he's guided by uh, Hermes, uh, who is the, the psychopomp. He's going for a lost loved one. Uh, the body of his son Hector. There's a gloomy lord, so Achilles is sort of seen as this um, uh, underworld figure. So, like, yeah, scholars have sort of argued that, like, sometimes there's a catabasis uh, met metaphorically. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I have this 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 theory that okay, this poem sort of invokes certain elements of the catabasis, and yeah, one of them. Uh, it's this idea of a symposium because symposium symposia are connect, connected with with the afterlife. Yeah. So this is going to be that this point, right? Um, that I'm very excited that David was able to come on to talk about because this is not a reading of this poem that really exists, and so I'm thrilled that we're going to have a chance uh, to offer it to you. So we've covered how this poem is sympotic, uh, metapoetic, and now we're going to make this shift into how that sympotic is connected to the uh, the catabatic. Uh, yeah. So just quick reminder about symposia. Here's a few images of these group celebration scenes. Um, these all come from Greek base painting, but you see like the music, the drinking, um, music, drinking, the, the groups of people, the vomiting, always that's nice too. Um, but the image I think that really helps make us this, helps make this connection comes from Pestum. So in Italy here. And here we have the tomb of the diver where somebody has decorated their tomb with scenes of living. I wonder if you yeah, want to take it over there. Yeah, so this is the idea that, okay, there's scenes of living. And I mean, if you look at, the, at that, the, the, the top part of the tomb there, you have like a diver taking the plunge from one world uh, into the next. And and also we have like the symposium sort of this idea of like eating and drinking as like, you know, that's uh, um, a main component uh, of living, but this idea like, oh, maybe there could be something like this uh, in the afterlife. And we have a lot of accounts sort of saying, oh, in the afterlife sort of everyone's, everyone's feasting, uh, everyone's drinking. Yeah, Christian, I know, I think we have like a, a, a passage from, from Plato's, uh, Plato's Republic where, so someone speaking, I forget it is, but they're talking about, oh yeah, in the, in the underworld, you have these different figures like Messiahs who are eating and, and, and drinking with all the all the blessed. Yeah, I, I neglected to add that one. Too. Okay, but yeah, it's a thing. I guess it it's, 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 it, it, yeah, it's like the idea of partying in the underworld, partying hardy uh, it, it is sort of a, a, a trope uh -huh. that, that, that comes up again and again. Uh, I also really like, uh, again, because of the juxtaposing, like, you know, that, Putting Catullus in the first century BCE next to this tomb from 475 BCE isn't necessarily uh, intuitive, but we'll see. Like we have the water element here at the top representing that uh, liminal space between um, above and below next to the wine. Uh, and so there's this idea that like, I don't know, and rivers are associated with death just because you have your lethes and your um, other ones. Ositis. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the Asheron, yeah. Yeah. Lot, so if you, if, but whereas wine, wine is a pure living thing. You've in fact taken a grape mm. and then made it something else uh, in a living metamorphosis versus the staleness maybe of water. And it's associated with Dionysus, who, who himself is a catamant. Kind of like he goes to the underworld uh, to, to retrieve his mother, um, yeah. which, will be, which will be important for, yeah, later. 
Um, so just to remind us of uh, the poem, because we've been away from it for a little bit. Um, you boy there, serving out the vintage vino, makes me stronger and sharper cupfuls, follow the lady of the revels' orders. Who's more drunk than the killer stuff she's drinking? You though, pure water nymphs, can get the hell out. A ruination to wine you are, move over. Join the Puritans, here the wine is unmixed. Um, and so we've talked a little bit about the Lumphi. And before we talk about Postumii and Thionianus, I, um, we might say something about the Falerni. Yeah, I know that this is sort of like considered high class wine. I know it's sort of like considered like some of the best. And this is like, and I don't know, it's just sort of like the, I, I'm wondering too, if, if wine equals poetry, is, is Catullus being like, this is going to be some of my <laughs> high vintage works coming up here uh, with yeah. this. I, I love that reading of it. Yeah, yeah. So Falernian, um, it's the wine when you see like people listing prices in Pompeii on graffiti of how much it costs. Like your, your common wine is going to be two asses, but like your Falernian wine is going to be 14 or 16. So... Um, but I, I love this idea that you have a good poetry, high quality poetry that you're bringing out. It's like, hey, here comes my Falerni and everything you've read so far. That's my like cheap vintage. That's my two buck Chuck. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting because the poems are coming up are pretty obscene and you sort of see like the sort of anxiety can tell us of, you know, what's if you want to jump back to Catella 16, like of what's good poetry, what's proper poetry. And you say, I don't know, maybe he thinks it's invective poetry like this is this is the real stuff here you know when i'm when yeah. i'm you know calling out memura and, and and caesar and if we think about like one of the things poetry does or po well yeah one of the things wine does is it changes your mentality mm -hmm. one of the things that like strong poetry can do is change your mentality right you can go from being like living your day every day and then somebody invects you with a poem mm -hmm. and uh now you're there's a very famous <laughs> anecdote that suetonius relates to us about caesar getting offended by Catullus's poem, but then like making up later on. Yeah. So yeah. I mean it can affect your status, it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> that like, you know, invective poetry is going around, sort of like, yeah, put put uh putting down your good name. Yeah, that can that can really change your status. Yeah. Like like wine can change your mind. Yeah. Uh, I mean then there's something, yeah, and Catullus, you know, he's not just thinking about these things uh, abstractly. He also puts it in at the level of the words and the sonic. Like we have this in jammed almost um, this um, elision that happens and then all of line four elides like ma gris de abrios aquí no abrios I like the whole line is uh, mimetic of slurring your words. Yep, just makes you sound drunk. Until that sharp new idea and we're getting rid of everybody. Now we, uh, we don't, we get rid of like the elisions as we get rid of the the lymphi and, and that's almost like and they might factor into our discussion later but that's almost i think a formulaic language because yeah i think we're, we're gonna talk about how like in some ways like this is like an initiation to a mystery and part of initiation is sort of knowing the the ritual language um this idea of casting away the the uninitiated <laughs> yeah. uh so could tell us i think could be doing that right and that fits i think kind of into this language of um the lex, this idea of a, a law that you have to follow, um, quo lubet, being quo libet, like, but in terms of that formulaic language. Um, so let's talk a little bit about our magistra postumia. So, yes. I don't uh, love how Green kind of cuts her, cuts her name out of there. But. No, it does kind of <laughs> ruin, and like, you would not see her, but at the same time, Critics of this poem have also not seen her that are working on it in Latin. Yes, true. Uh, the two approaches that you can take when you encounter a name, um, you can say it's meaningless, the kind of reading that here on Catalan Conversations uh, we find to be a snooze fest. Boring. <laughs> or it has significance. <laughs> so, Postumia, um, there's a, a strong popular reading of this poem in terms of his historicity, where there is a postumia that was Caesar's mistress. So uh, at the end of the video today, there's gonna to be a bibliography and you can find uh, the sources that are there for that. Uh, another really interesting one, uh, also historical, is 
the Lex Postumia, where uh, I have this translation here from the Scolia. Um, the Postumian law of King Numa runs, thou shalt not sprinkle the funeral pyre with wine, uh, which is going to be very interesting, I think, for us and this catabatic read. Um, but then also the sense of like posthumous, meaning in Latin, like coming last, being last, being the next thing, being late, being of bad quality, and then being dead. Yeah, I think all of these interpretations are interesting for, for different reasons. I mean, yeah, the Lex Postumia really kind of helps what I'm trying to say, if this is sort of an underworld journey uh, in this poem by its funeral associations. I also think Caesar's Mistress, if you want to get real historical here, is kind of interesting because it does look forward to um, poem 29, where he's attacking Caesar's, Caesar's soldier there, Mamura. Um, so that's interesting. Or yeah, the idea of coming late, bad quality, and you know, Catello sometimes is self-deprecating about his poetry, which makes sense. Um, but yeah, what I want to say is, well, again, I'm open to, to I'm into polyphony. Uh, this, this idea it could evoke the uh, uh, the death associations. I guess the Lex Postumia already does, but it's the name Postumia and its associations with death, where uh, we think that. The, the male version of a uh, posthumous is, is given to a child after the father um, after the father has died. Um, and I believe I think we have up uh, Catullus, uh, Horace uh, Carmen uh, to uh, poem 14, where he addresses, um, yeah, so he addresses this figure posthumous and it's basically about how, hey, we're all gonna die. We all gonna make that journey. Uh, to the underworld. Um, and yeah, he could be addressing some guy named Postumus, but also he could be playing off names because we do know like a lot of these Roman poets of the first century BC are sort of using pseudonyms or, 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 or names with significance. I mean, we could think of the Chronicles of Volusius poem, like, you know, is it is it just coincidence that he's, he's making fun of a poet whose name is Volusius for all the roles of the poetry that he, that he writes? Like there's something probably going on there. Um, so we have this poem where it's a poem about going down to the underworld and he's adjusting someone named Postumus. And there's actually another, there's a Propertius poem too, um, verses 312, where he, he addresses a Postumus. And that poem also has a, there's a story about Ulysses going to the underworld. Uh, as well. So it seems like later poets as associated this name with uh, Journeys to the Underworld and Death. So I'm wondering, hey, can we can we see that here with, with Postumia? Yeah. Uh, I like so much of what you said to comment briefly on um, running that line about being Caesar's mistress, this willingness that he is has to say, use lesbia as a pseudonym, but Postumia, he's not hiding a pseudonym there mm. with Caesar. Yeah. Later on, he will actually, he'll also use Caesar's name. Um, this idea of how you treat women and women's names in these situations. Um, and then if we just go back quickly, uh, the, the Postumia is a, a magistra, like this, mm -hmm. this level of authority that she has simultaneously, um, but we've kind of reversed it because Catullus is demanding from her um, that we get more wine as opposed to the Lex Numa uh, postumia, which is like, don't add wine. And so in a way, I think it's this association of wine with life. It's like, mm. if you put any, if you mix it, then you get yourself a little bit closer to death. And so you need to get rid of it entirely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. That makes a lot of sense to me. Sort of given like, yeah, the associations of, with Dionysus and, and, and rebirth. Also, I want to say that maybe she's a Persephone figure. <laughs> just, 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 just throw it out there if I'm, if I'm running with this argument. You know, she's the, the Magistra of, of this underworld symposium. Wow. And, you know, I think really there's no reason not to embrace the polyphony, as you mentioned, because Catullus III, we've already been dealing with catabatic elements around a bird. So why not like, have them here around this um, sympotic culture? Yeah. Now, now the poet himself is going, is going under, because he's got, he's got some reasons to. Yeah. So um, another word that, or a way that Green translates is he uh, uses unmixed. But of course, the last word of this um, poem is Thionianus. And uh, you've actually brought a really fascinating passage around 
this meaning or this name. Uh, you want to read this? Yeah. Gaidor Siklis 4 2. Sure. Yeah. Here, I think he's like talking about Heracles. We kind of switched to yeah. It's, it's funny, like how Dios is kind of like me being like, hmm, there's a lot of different heroes who go to the underworld. He's <laughs> kind of making these connections. Um, but yeah, arm, I think he's, armchair I mean, literary historians. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So he's talking about Heracles here, I believe. So he also took part in the expedition of the Argonauts, and because of love he held for his wife, he dared the amazing deed of descending into Hades. Where oh, this is Orpheus actually. Orpheus, sorry. Yeah. Where he where, where he where he entranced, um Persephone, uh, entranced, excuse me, entranced Persephone by his melodious song and persuaded her to assist him in his desires and to allow him to bring up his dead wife from Hades. In this exploit, resembling Dionysus, where the myths relate that Dionysus brought up his mother Semele from Hades and that sharing with her his own immortality, he changed her name to Thione. So yeah, I think it's really interesting because like her, her name, her other name, Thione, pops up here and there and associated with with sacrifice like duo burning but you know her story she does get burnt up by by zeus when he reveals himself um in, in his true form um and yeah i just think it's interesting how she kind of has this this transformation from semele to thione sort of after this catapsis and that's sort of a an element of the catapsis is, is the hero is often sort of, is often sort of transformed and obviously Dionysus is more the hero here but she's still part she see herself sort of conquers death by by coming back up uh, from the underworld um so yeah I I, I think it's interesting how this association of post catavasis or you know on the catavasis uh simile with this new name Thione and Yaquatellus calling calling Dionysus the Thionianus here. So I, I immediately just think of the catabasis when I when I see that name. Um, I, 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 I'm, when you sent me this passage, I just, it blew me away. Like all these different elements that he's accessing here. Um, I think, oops, one of the ones that I'm really entranced by is that Thuo element here, where if we really push this idea of the, the Lex Numa post Jumai, we have that, um, legal idea of funeral pyres introduced. Mm. And then we end the word with this word for like burning, the, the son of the one who was burned, um, sacrificed. And then we're saying like, let's um, not have any water, right? Give yeah. away water, which is what you would use to put out a fire. I, it's like, the, so now we have fire and water at play in the same way that we have like mixed and unmixed. Yeah. And I don't know if, if I'm just using a modern metaphor, but he's, but he's about to burn some people. <laughs> That's look at it as an analogy for yeah, you know, criticizing people with with fire and burning. But maybe that's my own perception of it. But yeah, I mean, to me, I think it ending with that, and I mean, this this line always struck me that he he matters as to to Onianos because I'm like, what is this talking about? And like, okay, it's probably talking about Bacchus. He's like, okay, this is this is unmixed wine here, but it's just an unusual a, a matronym here. Um, which, which is again talking about sort of inversion, social inversion here. Um, and yeah, it's a matronym associated with, with, with the underworld and, he, and he's ending with it. So I, I think I find that pretty significant. Yeah. Um, so the thing that relates to the catabatic elements uh, are these ideas of, of motion, but oddly enough, like I think, I think you're right that the poet is the person I think experiencing this, this journey um, but we have these other verbs of motion of uh, abate for the lymphi, right? Like to go away. Uh, he tells them to, to migrate, migrate. Uh, but meanwhile, the other verb of motion kind of that we have is um, that inger, like with using, like looking at prefixes. And so there's a, an interesting thing happening like with verbal prefixes, I think about um, toward and away, uh, yeah. I don't really so have like, any, anything to go with that, but moving in, sort of. Yeah, we're we're, we're moving in, and we're, we're sort of kicking other people out. Yeah. Right. This idea of who's allowed to be in. a part of it. Uh, mm -hmm. That might be a good moment to talk a little bit about um, mysteries associated with the yes. symposium or catabatic culture or anything. Yeah. So yeah, let's 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 talk about the mysteries. I forget. Do you have, do you have a slide on the, the mysteries? Yep. Yeah. So yeah, part of what I'm 
trying to say here is that okay so we have could tell us we had the reference to, to, to the death of postumia and it's, it's okay they're, they're drinking and drinking is a thing that that happens in the underworld uh but also with these cults so the payments with the Eleusinian mysteries a, a part of um this this mystery cult is sort of obscene language and mockery we know that was like part of the ritual and famously here yeah you have the hymn to the meter um uh where uh sorry yambe um she sort of cheers up the, the sad uh demeter with her with her sort of dirty jokes um and and, and mockery and we know that the actual the initiates of this mystery cult there was some sort of element of of mockery and this idea of like well, they're, they're going on this journey which sort of symbolized their journey to the underworld and on this they're sort of like so they're like they go they cross like a bridge and then these sort of like interesting sort of got crossing crossing between different worlds and the the initiates sort of mock the 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 the, the newcomers uh to the uh to to the cult right. um and it's also interesting just because we have this up uh this idea of wine versus um, barley water, right? So it's yeah. So the, the wine water, yeah, uh, contrast, yeah. Uh, um, so the mysteries were also involved. Uh, it seems very clear. Like so, this is from the villa of the mysteries. Uh, obviously, wide open to interpretation, just as much as the poems. But an image that gets referenced frequently for this idea of perhaps some looking at dirty things, uh, dirty jokes that might like be there. You have whatever's being revealed here uh, and then this figure turning away, so. Is that a winged figure or is that just? Yeah. That's really interesting, yeah. Yeah, and over here looking inside of the bo uh, the young person looking inside of the bowl. Uh, maybe there's a tondo there, but we have the mask behind of old age, so. Yeah more more mystery more mystery stuff running around in yeah Italy. so yeah i guess so so how i i, I see this is that okay could tell us sort of has a few markers here to say okay we got some underworld imagery here with yeah with postumia with the the the, the the, the drinking and the reference to thionius and sort of like okay we're, go, we're going down now because i'm going down to the underworld because i'm gonna take some people to task here. And then in the following poems, you know, we're, we're in the underworld and he's sort of, you know, attacking people much like we have this sort of ritual mockery uh, in these, um, in these mystery cults. And then makes me think too about sort of like, are there other sort of comparanda for using the underworld for mockery? And yeah, obviously we have the things like the mysteries, but yeah, we could jump back to the frogs where uh, uh, Aristophanes play the frogs where you know he's using the underworld to to mock people uh from the past and 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 from his own time and then we jump forward to dante uh in italian literature where you know dante is making fun of people who are he's putting people who are still alive in the underworld yeah i mean it becomes one of these um other places like for uh for aristophanes right it's just like cloud cuckoo land and the underworld are these equal alternative environments in which you can play out the drama. And so, you know, for Catullus, it's on the sheet of papyrus is where you can play out these dramas uh, in a different way than your lived daily life. Even though, of course, um, for the poets, they, they'll say poetry is not life, but poetry is a lived embodied yes. experience. Yes. Uh, so as long as you, because you mentioned Caparanda, I do have another one that I want to bring up. Um, which is Shiduri from the Epic of Gilgamesh, specifically as like a comparanda to um, Postumia. Um, so this is from Tablet 10. Shiduri was a tavern keeper who lived by the seashore. There she dwelt in an inn by the seashore. Pot stands she had and vats all of gold. She was swathed in hoods and veiled with veils. Gilgamesh came wandering. He was clad in a pelt and fearful to look on the flesh of the gods he had in his body but in his heart, there was sorrow. So one of the reasons I think like this might be a useful or interesting caparanda is we might be missing something of a sense of like female tavern keepers at these liminal spaces that mm -hmm. negotiate that crossing into the underworld. Yeah, that, that, that's really cool and, and makes a lot of sense. I'm trying to think of like, yeah, in mystery calls, do we have any female figures who sort of are 
I guess, I mean, if you look at the LSD mysteries, I mean, it's in the American Demeter, we have like Yambi, you know, and, and Demeter herself is sort of like stand at that threshold between, yeah, the upper world and this, this world of mystery cults. But um, yeah. Uh, Persephone is the person that goes back and forth most easily. We hear yeah. these tales of heroes, but like they go once, maybe twice if they're lucky, but Persephone is just doop a doop a doop. Yeah, and sort of like it's um, interesting because yeah, like the, like the heroes do it once, maybe twice, but like it almost kills them. But there's something about, yeah, Persephone's power where she's able to sort of, yeah, live between these two worlds. So then I think I have another piece of uh, material culture here. This is a uh, late, I think this is second century CE, uh, Roman sarcophagus. Um, but what, what I really like about this is it captures, this is the, the lighthouse of Claudius here. Um, it captures that juxtaposition of like the sea next to the tavern. Um, just thinking about even like food and drink as a liminal space as this uh, image is kind of capturing. So nothing, nothing definitive here. I just want to say there might be something else happening in terms of the, the visual cultural imagination than necessarily all our sources uh, yeah. really explicitly attest to. There's a thing too, like in the symposium too, so much of like the sympathetic poetry that we have is about going on a ship <laughs> or, or going on a journey too. So that the idea like us drinking together we get, can take us to different worlds too. Um, not saying this is exactly like a symposium here, but it's, you know, yeah. some sort of like, some sort of yeah, shared drinking space. And one likely where you're supposed to be safe. Um... Yeah, you're safe from all the dangers of the sea, yeah. Uh, I'm reminded, and I wish I had the citation on hand. Um, if I were running a good YouTube channel, I would say it's going to be in the description, but it will not be in the description. Uh, um, where there's this anecdote of these this group of sympathetic drinkers. They were in a house, and they but they started telling stories about being on a ship, and they got so drunk they thought they were on a ship, and it was tilting. So they started throwing their benches out of the windows, and then they got fined by the government for causing a disruption. <laughs> That's awesome. I want to find that, that citation. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll share it with you on Twitter. They, they, they took, they took Archaeolicus a little too far. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, here's a bibliography for those of you for some of these things upon which we've drawn. Uh, David, I really want to thank you for coming in to talk to me about this poem that so many people have been rather contemptuous of if they bother to talk about it at all. Oh, thank you, Christian. It's great. I, I appreciate you going on this journey with me. Yeah. That's great. And everybody else, we'll see you at the next Catullan conversation. <laughs>